G'day and welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Buck and I'm the CEO of the McKell Institute and welcome to McKell HQ where we've got an exciting event tonight. Uh, 100 days of Biden on the eve of that important anniversary. Uh, tonight, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we are fortunate enough to meet tonight, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, we are joined by Senior Fellow of the US Studies Centre, Bruce Wolp, who will also be joined by McKell Institute Chair, Dr. Craig Emerson, who was also the former Minister for, among many other things, Trade and Minister Assisting the Minister for uh, Asian Sanctuary Policy, We're all relevant to tonight's discussion. We will be uh, moderated very ably by ABC journalist uh, Fauzia, and I'd like to throw over to her now, but thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for that uh, introduction. And welcome, everybody, to the McHale Institute's uh, panel discussion on 100 days of Biden. Can you believe it? It's been 100 days only. Um, now, why 100 days? Well, the tradition of looking back at a new president's 100, first 100 days in office actually started with Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933, that he came to power at a time of the Great Depression. Of course, the country was in stripe highs, unemployment, um, the economy just wasn't doing very well. So he rolled up his sleeves, immediately introduced a raft of social, economic and political uh, legislation and really got down to work and turned the country around. Sounds familiar? Let's fast forward now to nine decades later. There's a new inhabitant uh, in the Oval Office. His name is Joseph Biden. And he has just come to power during the time of a once in a lifetime pandemic. Again, the country finds itself with very high unemployment. The economy is on the brink of collapse as well. What does he do? Rolls up his sleeves, gets straight to work on the first day in office. He has introduced the $1.9 trillion uh, American Rescue Plan that's gone to uh, uh, issue direct checks to Americans who are struggling. It's helped fi uh, finance businesses that are struggling as well, expanded health care as well. He's also uh, signal an ambitious plan to address climate change. Of course, he's just come off his virtual summit of the climate change where international leaders have also stepped up their pledge to reduce uh, emissions, uh, uh, carbon emissions as well. Uh, Joseph Biden, by the way, has said that he aims to reduce America's carbon emissions by between 50 to 52% by 2030. Very ambitious, just like many of his policies. Now, he has definitely set the tone and steered the path for the United States under his leadership, but what lies ahead? There's a lot of ambitious plans. There are a lot of challenges as well. And to guide us through perhaps what's gone through the last 100 days, but also what we can expect from Joseph Biden and his administration, we're joined and we have the expertise of the Honorable Dr. Craig Emerson, eminent, uh, eminent economist and former minister in the Rudd and Gillard governments and director of the Australian Apex Studies Center, RMIT. Craig, always great to have you. Good uh, to see you. To talk to and you. to everyone. Uh, we also have with us uh, Bruce Wolpe, who is the uh, senior fellow at the United States Studies Center and former Democrat staffer in the US Congress during the Obama administration. Bruce, we talk a lot as well. We Wonderful do. to see you. Wonderful. Thank Thanks you for doing this, Fauci, and, and guiding us through this maze. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm very fortunate to be uh, on this panel with two very brilliant minds now, of which I will pick. I want to get your thoughts, Craig, on the first 100 days. What, what, how do you think Joseph Biden has put his stamp on the Oval Office? It would have to be described as a surprise, a pleasant surprise. Uh, remember the tag uh, from Donald Trump leading up to the presidential election campaign, Sleepy Joe? Mm. Well, I don't think he's been too sleepy. In fact, I'm not sure he's got much sleep at all. And the sense was that he didn't have really much energy. He'd been around the Congress for a long time. He'd need to have good people around him, which President doesn't. Um, and, and he had managed to attract good people. It's probably not um, so clear in the public eye, but 
frankly, and this is a frank discussion, I don't think um, Donald Trump could be, um, you know, be charged with being guilty of having good people around him. He, he tended particularly towards the end, having people around who just said, yes, Mr. President, whatever crazy idea that you've just come up with is true. Uh, and we saw that with the whole question of whether um, uh, Joe Biden won the election. I mean, 30 million Americans at least believe Donald Trump, uh, enabled by lots of his people in the White House who said, we won the election. 30 million American voters believe that. So I'm saying the contrast is really big and not so obvious in that I had felt confident that if Joe Biden was elected, he would attract professionals. Mm. And now they might not even all be Democrats, you know. Um, they could just be people who want to change America for the, for the better. And you'd have to rate um, his cabinet and start you know, very, very highly, mm. very, very highly. So probably an understated um, but important aspect of this. John Kerry will get to this uh, running around the world, but very, very smart and experienced on climate change. Has Had been negotiating with China, uh, in, which actually led to the successful Paris Agreement, right? And there, China and America have been, you know, arguing and you know, quite hard on lots of other stuff, the economy and, and strategic things. But because these two knew each other, they got together and they've actually created the preconditions for a much more ambitious Paris um, meeting or, or COPs meeting uh, in November in Glasgow. So already that's one example of a really able um, supporter uh, in the White House. And then, of course, Janet Yellen, former you know, Secretary of the Federal Reserve, we could go on and on and on. But anyway, the kind of idea for this was... The scars that I felt four years ago when I was on the phone to Bruce and the votes were coming in and the tears were starting to well in my eyes and I said, Bruce, it doesn't look too good, does well, it? I tell you, last October you were a little tense. <laughs> I said, well, if, if, you know, if Trump can win it once, he can win it twice. And what he had was an absolutely rock solid base, but enough of the bigger number of voters in 2016 peeled away from him. And I'm sure we'll get to the reasons why they peeled away from him, which might have meant they voted Democrat, but more likely they just didn't vote. Um, and then the Democrats learned their lesson, I think, of 2016, which is, you know, in those um, industrial states, the, you know, the so-called blue states that they weren't really worried about and actually lost. It's not, again, that people went for Trump in huge numbers, it's just they didn't vote Democrat, they stayed home. Voter suppression um, led to the loss of some of those states and therefore the election. So absolutely right. I was tense, <laughs> hoping everyone had learned their lessons and they had. Yes. Uh, Bruce, what about you? The first 100 days of the Biden administration. I just want to build on uh, what Craig was saying, and I agree with, uh, with, with what you did say. I think Biden has had just an excellent start I think it is a function of his being the most experienced person to come into the presidency in decades and perhaps even going back to Thomas Jefferson. But if you think about the most recent president, so Carter, governor of Georgia, mm. Clinton, governor of Arkansas, H.W. Bush, he was uh, head of the CIA, he was vice president, uh, member of the, served one term in the House, Obama, a state legislator who became a senator, served in the Senate for two years, yeah. and Trump, who wasn't elected to anything. I kind of wish that Trump had been once elected dog catchers who would have known what civic service was. Mm. Uh, but uh, so against that, he, Biden brings over three decades in the Senate and eight years as vice president to this position. I think he's been clear on his agenda. I think he's moved with utmost deliberation and speed. His cabinet choices, as Craig said, I think they've been excellent. Um, his staff has expertise and experience. I think it's been very well received by people. These are competent people who know how to do the jobs that they're assigned to. Um, he promised an administration that looks like America. And this, his cabinet it looks like America. Mm. It has women. It has uh, gay and transgender people. It has Asian Americans. It has African Americans. It, so it spans the spectrum and looks more like the country instead of a whole bunch of white men. Um, his personal popularity is strong. Uh, support, it's, uh, support for his policies are higher. So his policies are more popular than he is. He's coming in at about 52, 54% mm -hmm. right now. That is less than Obama enjoyed at this time, less than uh, Bush enjoyed at this time, less than Clinton enjoyed at this time. Uh, 
uh, but it's still above 50% and Trump never cracked 50%. Um, support for his disapprovals in the 40 to 42 range, which kind of equals what Trump's approval was. So there's no surprise there. Those who are really wedded to Trump, they disapprove of Biden and so forth. Um, E.J. Dion wrote this morning in the Washington Post, it says, uh, in this very polarized era, not being hated is an achievement. <laughs> and I think, and Biden is not hated. You may no. disagree with him, but you don't hate him. Yeah. Uh, his priorities, uh, and the issue is not so far, not how left, how, how far left is his agenda. The issue is how pragmatic is his agenda. Um, and I think that pragmatism reflects his outlook. You're dealing with the worst crisis in a long time, this pandemic, and it has to be grappled with. So his priorities have been very clear and very straightforward. Control the pandemic, roll out the vaccine, get the economy going again, expand health care coverage, uh, then deal with the social issues, racial justice, voting rights, gun control, immigration, climate change. That's the agenda. Now, that's complex and will involve a lot of surgery in the country, but people get it because they, that's on their minds. When George Floyd is murdered, well, that's on everyone's minds. Why does this happen? You know, how you ultimately come down on it, but people have to, they realize it has to be dealt with. On the international front, I think the agenda is also clear. First, repair relations with the allies, bring them back. Biden traveled to Europe three years before the election when Trump was in and he was giving Merkel hell and it was a really tough time. And Biden went to a, a NATO meeting or EU meeting and he says, America will be back. And that's what he's saying consistently now. America is back, I'm back, we're there. Uh, and then the trouble spots in the world, China, Iran, North Korea, Russia, he wants to deal with that. Um, I think the first, these first few weeks, these first 100 days have been really important because he had to get through the rescue program on the pandemic and the economy. And he said he wanted to be bipartisan, but the Republicans didn't want to play ball. They couldn't play ball, and we can get into that. But they knew, he knew he had to get it, and the Republicans knew that they had to stop it. But they didn't, and he did get it, and he's using the same formula for the next two big things. One is infrastructure, which is out now. And then that's a $2.3 trillion program of infrastructure broadly defined, mm -hmm. which is not just roads, bridges, highways. It's also broadband. It's also electricity grids. It's also water pipe grids. And it's also uh, things like housing for aged Americans. That's infrastructure too. And he wants that. And that program is very popular and he wants to pay for it by raising taxes uh, companies under Trump took a tax, enjoyed a tax cut from 36 to 21 percent. It was a one trillion dollar tax cut. Biden's saying, OK, I want half of that back and I want to raise it from 21 to 28. And for individuals, he says, you're if you make over 400,000 a year, your taxes are going to go up. But they're not going to go up if you don't make $400,000 a year. So it's it's pitched to the middle class. So there was a deep understanding that by Democrats that he had to succeed in this first hurdle of the rescue plan. And Republicans knew if they could stop him on that, then they could break it. Mm. And we will see this played out in the subsequent big uh, programs that are uh, coming to Congress. And why is Biden doing this? He's doing it because of what happened when he was Obama's vice president 12 years ago. And it was uh, the great, the, the GFC, the huge recession in the world, uh, uh, failures of the banks and so forth and mortgages and everything. And Obama came in and says, okay, I have a fix for it. Um, I propose a trillion dollars. And then Republicans said, well, you want some of our support. No, you're going to have to cut that back. Uh, Obama, to get three Republican votes in the Senate, none in the House, cut it back to like $800 billion. He, so he got his rescue plan. It did work, but it didn't work fast enough. Mm -hmm. Employment didn't come back fast enough. The American economy was sort of sluggish. Yeah. It took months and months and months to reduce unemployment. And that led to ultimately a rebellion where the voters took, got rid of the Democrats in Congress two years later. We'll see what that happened. So the lesson from 2009-10 was uh, don't con go big and get things, get past what is needed to meet the challenge at hand. Mm -hmm. And that's what Biden is doing. So I see four patterns, early patterns for the Obama presidency. First, on his major decisions, he wants to be decisive, to go bold, to go big, to go early. Get this done fast. Second, uh, the second pattern is his policies are popular with the American people. 
but uh, they're fully opposed by the Republicans in Congress. He's winning Republican voters for his programs, but he's not winning Republican, Republicans serving in the Congress. Mm -hmm. They're just against. The third thing is we see an orderly presence, presidency, it's sort of normal. Well, guess what? He gets a daily intelligence briefing. Mm -hmm. Guess what? The press secretary shows up and briefs every day and she doesn't tell lies from the podium. Guess what? The FBI is not interviewing the White House staff. No one has been fired. I mean, this is really kind of nice. Mm. And I don't know about you, Valzia, but I wake up every morning and I don't wonder what the hell did the president do overnight? <laughs> I think the collective blood pressure around the world has dropped to like, it's probably about 110 over 70 right now, which is pretty good. And I think people really appreciate that this is, it's working like it kind of should work. Weekends are back. You know, he goes away for the weekend. He's not tweeting from some gilded room in Florida when he goes away, it's nice. Um, and the fourth big pattern is global leadership. He wants to rebuild alliances around the world and uh, lead the world. Uh, and the climate summit last week was an early example of that. One thing has not gone right, immigration. There is a crisis on the Southern border. It is not under control. I think they took the, they just haven't gotten on top of it yet. And it, that hurts them because that's a real button that the Republicans are pushing goes going back to Trump as to what those issues are. So I think that's really important. So these patterns he's going to take forward for the next big issues, and I think that's really uh, significant. And then I just want to close on Biden and Australia. Um, the relationship is excellent. Uh, it's enduring. It goes back a century. It's 100, it is 100 years of mateship. And um, regardless of party, regardless of leader, through the decades, it is there. And uh, you know, it was really forged in World War II when mm. Australia turned to America because of what was happening in the Pacific as opposed to the UK. Um, so it's solid. The Biden foreign policy team knows this country. They've been to the Australia several times. They have a deep affection and regard for it. Um, and that we've already seen how they've been helpful on China, where they say, we're not gonna leave you on the field and things like that. Uh, but uh, as with, uh, there are differences. And as with climate, I don't care what prime minister Morrison says, he is not going to slow down Biden and carry one step. <laughs> they're, they're, I think so, they know that. They, I think they know that. And the issue is, this is where the United States is. Well, Australia, you got to figure out where, what you're mm -hmm. going to do. But there, he's not going to hold, he's not going to punish Morrison for what, it, it doesn't rise to that level. And, um, but it is, it will be a fact of life. And on China, I think reviving the, putting life into the quad and bring the leaders together so that there could be, again, the strategy with China is let's, let's roll up all the allies and that gives us more leverage with China. So that's how I see the first 100 days. I think Biden sleeps well at night and I think he um, and I think he's, uh, feels pretty good about where he is, but he needs more victories. And we will know by August whether he's going to get them. He does. He does need more victories. He's, he's promised a lot. Yeah. There's a lot to do. Yes. And the midterms are coming up next year. In yes. November, I think it is. Yes. So there's, uh -huh. he has a very short time to deliver. Yeah. But I want to take us back to um, 2016 without traumatizing you in any way, Craig. Is your blood pressure? Yeah, yeah. Is your, oh, your blood pressure. <laughs> Low down. <laughs> <laughs> deep breath, deep breath. Um, you know, it has been said that um, Trump was voted in because it was a reaction to the Obama administration, eight years of Obama. And then it's been said that Biden was voted in because it was a reaction to Trump's four mm. years in office as well. Do you think that is the case or do you think because Biden offered, a, 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 you know, a, an alternative normality, perhaps? As Bruce yeah, I think, I think the blood pressure... Um, gauge has been very important for Americans, you know, so um, don't, don't wrap around their arms every, every night. But uh, what happened, which is a bit unusual, I'll be corrected by um, Bruce, um, the Democrats won the House. They already had a majority in the House by one senator. Right. When the Capitol was being stormed, the results had come in from a runoff in Georgia. And um, that is, you know, it, it was not under their arrangements fully determined who had won. So they had a re-election, basically. And while the storming of the Capitol was going on, they're trying to report on what happened. The Democrats won both of those, right? right. Both. Yes. And Stacey Abrahams must take a lot of credit yes. for, um, the, because the Trump turnout. really yeah. basically said, don't vote, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, he only it, wants certain people. To it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's fake. Um, I've won the election already, don't vote. The great thing is that they, they did, and they were African-Americans in large numbers, and that meant that by a whisker, 
the Democrats have the votes in the Senate. And what's really what um, I think Bruce is saying, and he'll tell me or confirm or, or say, no, Craig, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, those midterms are going to be really important yeah. because I think the uh, history has been the number of seats you lose in the House in a first term uh, presidency is like 15 or something. It's closer to two dozen. And the margin in the House is six. Is six. Mm. Six. Mm. Six. And in the Senate, you also, the, the incumbent loses, well, they can't afford to lose one. Right. And so, and if they don't have a majority in either of those, what Bruce is saying is that the Republicans will block everything. That's well, right. That's why he has to yeah. get those runs on the board, get this stuff through in those two years, and presumably not take into the Congress policies that are not so popular yeah. because the Republicans can organise around those. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Bruce, it, it, this is the third time lucky for Biden. He's tried yes. his hand at the presidency twice before, third time lucky. lucky. Is it because it's his time or is it because of circumstances? I think more circumstances, actually. Uh, if the pandemic had not occurred, I think Trump would have won re-election. And I think he uh, narrowly, but I think his base, just given the size of his vote, under the, these circumstances, when America has been through a catastrophe mm -hmm. and 500, over 500,000 dead, you know, going into the election, and that he still did as well as he did. Mm -hmm. So you take all that away. Uh, I think I actually. So who, who didn't vote for him? Was it older people who said, no, you're risking my life. Or? I think I think some. I think a lot of older people were yes, were just affected in Arizona. A lot of seniors right. votes Democratic, and then Afri in Georgia, Africa, yeah, yeah. African American vote. But I mean, in Trump the context of the um, pandemic, you know that people no, I, who I, would ordinarily vote for him might, might have felt in, well. You've let in, me in down. Australian terms, the, the voters in the eastern suburbs and Moringa, looking at what happened on health care, mm. would have right. said, "I'm voting Labor." Right. Okay. Yeah. Because it was what happened was intolerable mm. to them. But he still did. You know, he got six million more votes than he had in. Turnout was higher. Biden got more votes, but he still got more. Trump had got more he than he got in twenty six. He vote. improved his aggregate vote. Mm. So I. So I. I do think without the pandemic that would have been harder. But on the other hand, I don't. Without the pandemic, I don't think Biden would have been the nominee. In other words, when you're facing a crisis of this magnitude. You need someone that you trust who has the experience to mm. get this job done. And that's what Biden, he said two things. I'm going to, I am going to do this. And I want to help bring the country together. Yeah. Country immensely divided from Trump. So I think those circumstances combined for Biden. All other things being equal, I think the Democrats would have turned to someone younger, more dynamic. I mean, let's face it. President Biden does not have much charisma, right? I mean, <laughs> what's his Q rating on TV? A thousand? And, <laughs> <laughs> Sleepy Joe, as Sleepy young Joe. Called, yeah. I, so I, th I think uh, I think the de Democrats would have turned. It could have been a Buddha judge. It could have been Elizabeth Warren. I don't think it would have necessarily been. Could have been someone else. But we'll face it. We'll face that. But would it have few years. also been the case that um, a Republican who really had never or rarely ever voted Democrat? Would have said, "Gee, Elizabeth Warren, that's a big leap. That's that's a, that's a big leap." But this is sort of a little jump. Yeah, uh, just to jump to the yeah, left, exactly. and a step to the right. But they, 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 keep calling, they keep calling. They keep calling Biden. They keep calling Biden a socialist. He's not a socialist. No, no. He doesn't no. like a socialist. No. <laughs> and so that, that sort of sense, well. of, <laughs> sense of him being around for a long time, he's not going to tear the joint apart. Exactly. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Safe hands. Mm. Experienced hands. Experienced hands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's Uncle Joe that's by, that's uh, guiding America through this pandemic. And there's a bit of a parallel here in uh, John Howard in 1996. Yes. They'd been around and around the Mulberry Bush yeah. with Howard and Peacock and Peacock and Howard and Howard and Peacock. Yes. And then they went to Alexander Downer. Uh, yes. And then um, and, and someone was scratching his, who could we get to run as leader of the Let's opposition? Let's bring Howard back. Why don't we get Howard back? Oh, okay. <laughs> and people went, oh, yeah, we kind of know it. Yeah. yeah. Sure, why not? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've, we've talked about how he got to where he is now. Let's talk about what he's actually doing in the Oval Office. You know, yeah. earlier on, we were talking about this $1.9 trillion mm. American rescue package that he managed to get through and it's helping the economy. It's definitely helping businesses, helping a lot of people as well, expanding healthcare as well. 
Um, and now he's proposing the larger $2 trillion American jobs plan to be spent over the next eight years. That's going to be, Bruce, as you said, will we'll address public infrastructure, housing, manufacturing. And very importantly, and we're going to touch on this a little bit later, and clean energy mm -hmm. investment um, as well. I want to go to a, a question that um, the audience has uh, written in. David Caldwell asks, do you think that the U.S. has the capacity to pay for the 1.9 trillion COVID assistance package, as well as the proposed infrastructure package. This is the thing, it's wonderful to spend. Mm. How are you going to fund well, it? Well, on the way, I was reading a discussion between Martin Wolf of the Financial Times and Larry Summers, yes. who was mm. Treasury Secretary under Obama. Obama. Mm. Larry Summers says it's too big. Actually says it's too big. Now, he's the guy we won't get into all this about secular stagnation. We need stimulus, you know, we need fiscal support. So he's not, you know, um, uh, Milton Friedman or anything like that. But sometimes something gets so big that someone's going to say it's too big. who has got some credibility. The only way we're going to judge this is in the end, you know, yeah. the, old, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Yeah. Um, but there is yeah. a lot of changes in the world economy which have meant that, it's it, it not really sustainable just on its own. You do right. need this support. Um, and I'm more of the disposition to say, if in doubt, do more, okay. rather than okay. if in doubt, do less. And I think that's what you described with Obama. Yes. Right? If in doubt, or he couldn't, you were saying, because he, you know, could have had to negotiate. At the time. And, yeah. you know, we've had, this is Larry Summers' term, we've actually had about a decade of secular stagnation, right, right, which is high unemployment mm. and blah, mm. um, probably because he didn't do exactly enough. Right. It, to give you an idea of the scale of what uh, Biden is proposing. So you add up all those numbers, it comes to about six trillion dollars. US yeah. dollars. US too. dollars. Yeah. That's a lot of shekels, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a lot of Australian it's, dollars. It's a lot too. of Australian dollars, <laughs> even more valuable than the shekels. That's about three times so, the size <laughs> of our entire economy. Well, right. right. And and the six trillion is four times the size of the annual budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty huge. But but the political calculation is. Americans know deep down that things are not working. Yeah. The bridges are corroding. Mm. I'm not getting my health care. Mm. I'm not my income is not going. I'm not getting wealthier. And so we need to and and I and I think it comes out of COVID that there's a new paradigm that where government was the enemy under Ronald Reagan, people understand that the, only the government is big enough to yeah. address my problem. Yeah. And that's the political and calculation that he's doing. No? Right. Know, they won't say, we'll privately build bridges and we'll right. privately build airports and we'll yeah. privately That's the calculus. Okay. That's the calculus. Sure, but he's, you know, he's proposing raising the corporate rate. Yes. Now, from 21%, as you said earlier, to 28% mm. as yes. well. Private wealth will also be taxed as yes. well. You talked about the ordinary American realizing that healthcare is not working, that you know bridges need to be built and everything. The wealthy Americans are not going to give him their vote if they keep taking away. From I think a lot, a lot won't, but they're, they're, we're they talking about one, time, but we're talking about one percent of the population. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, again, if, if this, um, uh, I think among many of the American people, they look at uh, that over the past ten years, it, trillions of dollars have accrued to 1% of the population, yeah. Silicon Valley and others, and the corporations are really not giving back, that this is a moment to give back something to, yeah. for everyone to that. And, and what happened in that in the period that we're talking about, particularly there was a recovery uh, more yeah. recently. Yeah. Know, corporations pocketed. And what, what I mean by that is that they did what are called share buyback. So if, if you had 100,000 shares, at a dollar each, then you've got hundred thousand dollars. If you buy back thirty thousand of those shares, then the share price goes up, exactly. right? Because less shares, and that's what they're doing. They're just plowing it into share buybacks to increase the share price. And by the way, CEO salaries are linked to the share price yeah. in the US. So I think whether that was a big vote changing issue, it, it is a source of the inequity of, of the terrible inequality that they said. What are we going to do? We could invest, yeah. you know, in bridges and that, yeah. that, or we could do share buybacks and increase our salaries. But all the, this is exactly what the Republicans are going to test. It, it's too much spending. Mm -hmm. It's going to bankrupt the country. It's a radical leftist agenda, and uh, and America will be hurt. And so th this, so these two competing ideas mm -hmm. about how to proceed are going to 
you know, the, the conversation here in Australia is because of the job seeker, job keeper. Mm. We had all the rescue plans in Australia as well, very early on in the pandemic. The the question that kept coming up over and over again: How will future generations pay for this? this? That's right. That's the question. Is that the conversation that's being that, held in America as well? And I think there's an element of fear that this yeah. is going to come yeah. home and roost. But yeah, I mean, we could get on with this and mother day, but they don't have to. Mm. And if I'm not in the camp of modern monetary theory. Mm. But when things, so think of a, a, you know, a, a body that's sort of kind of really flat out, you know, yeah. and it gets a shot of adrenaline, you know, like that's really what's happening. Right. And um, you can stimulate that without destroying the joint, or you can stand back and just say, let's just watch it go up. Right. And that's really what is going on. When you talk about $6 trillion though, and you know, it's wonderful to have all these plans and everything. And you know, the, the, the reports say it'll be spent over the next eight years or mm. so, which means over Biden's term and yes. perhaps more if he does stay on or yes. if someone else takes over. Yes. Um, is it going to the right places? Do, no. do, do you think it will go to His the His intention is it targets the middle. In other words, it's not just for poor, poor people. He says, I want to build the economy and the country from the bottom up and the middle out. Mm. So he wants to expand the middle class and have middle class job security and have middle class income security mm. where, where real incomes, this is your stag stagnation point, mm. real incomes are rising instead of staying flat. Yeah. And where the kids can go to college mm. and uh, he wants to get rid of tuition for community colleges and that there's just more opportunity. If it if it really bites and people see the benefits, the thinking is, yes, it'll be politically rewarded. If you do all this, have all this upheaval in Washington, but I'm not feeling it when mm. I'm back home next year, could be trouble. And think of all those um, workers, again, in those blue states that yeah. flipped. One of the key reasons they flipped was that they didn't have job security. They were in yeah. so-called rust their incomes states, were not going up. And their incomes yeah. weren't going up and they always had reason to worry about their jobs. That's right. And they're actually naturally democratic voters, but Trump said, I'll drain the swamp, it's all this big yeah. stuff, bad stuff that's going on in Washington, yeah. and I'll take on China and you'll have job security under me. Well, that's really what yeah. Biden is trying to, that's his story, but he's got a different way of delivering it. Yeah. We're, we're gonna see Thursday morning here. There's, if Biden's speech to Congress is 11 a.m. Thursday, Eastern Standard Time here. Um, he's gonna make the case as to why this is so important and why it's going to work. And the question is, will people buy it? So mm -hmm. we're going to, we'll find out. Right. Well, is it next week, is his, are his poll numbers going to be better next week or worse? Mm -hmm. We'll see. You know, Trump also promised to boost manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, some of this money, some of this funding, these trillions of dollars will go into boosting manufacturing again. Can he do that in the US? Well, he can, can bring if back he, the jobs we, into we, the factories. I and, suspect we might be you know, in transition towards climate change. But yeah. my view is, yes, if it's jobs of the future. Right? But if he says, look, 20 years ago, this is how we used to make automobiles. We're going to do that again. You know, we're going to get the V8s going. I'm being a bit yeah. absurd, yeah. which is unusual for me. But um, <laughs> the point is, if, if you try to go down memory lane with people and with the policies, I reckon they're smart enough to work that stuff out. And I right. say, no, no. Those jobs are going or they're gone. But if he tells a story, which he could, a credible story about the jobs of the future being related to this big, you know, like once in a century uh, transition from fossil fuels yeah. towards clean energy, that's credible. That's yeah. very credible. Yeah. And I think that's where he's going. It, it, will he, will Americans buy that message, do you think, that transition? If ultimately it's delivered to them, yes. Mm. But I, I think, there, again, he's, he's not hated. His policies are popular. Yeah. People want to see, they're saying, yeah, that, I, I agree with that. But the, the question is a year from now, are jobs really, those threatened, like in coal and mining and so forth, are they, do they see other opportunities? Yeah. Is the, has the economy lifted enough that other boats are rising? Yeah. Then, yeah, he'll be, he will be rewarded. But it's, I mean, we are right there at this juncture. Yeah. And remember the that, future. Um, Pennsylvania wasn't like that was a really fascinating fight. Yes. Because it's a coal, it's a coal seam gas yeah. state. It's a very much. Right. He says, I'm not, I'm, I'm against yeah. fracking. 
Yeah. But he carried Pennsylvania. Yes. Yeah, which is because they bought the message. Amazing. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. And and that does bring us to the next top next topic, which is climate change. Yeah, How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's just you know Joe Biden has hosted this um, virtual climate summit mm. and leaders have come on and and everybody's coming away feeling pretty good about the world and the direction and you know Biden has basically pledged to reduce America's carbon emissions by 50 to 52 percent by 2030 he doesn't have that long no. uh, to go and he's going to put a lot of investment into clean energy into clean technology as well into research as well um, but I get the feeling that the world is quite skeptical though about these promises because the US does have a record of going back on their promises you know I I had a, a quick look around to look at the record America's record in 1997 Clinton signs the Kyoto Protocol but the US Senate refuses to ratify it okay 2002 George W Bush walks away from the agreement offers an alternative which the world says it's not going to work 2015, the Obama administration was critical of the Paris Climate Agreement and didn't submit it to the Congress for ratification. 2016, we saw President Trump tear up the Paris Accord. 2020, why do you think the international community will believe Joe Biden will deliver on his... Um, uh, well, uh, with a lot of countries. Uh, let's, the best way I can answer that is by examples, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not in the kind of esoteric... Okay. Have a look at the big car makers in the US. Um, I, I don't know if all of them have yet, but General Motors and General Motors said they're going all EV in the mid, you, in the mid 30s. If you don't consume petrol, yeah. that makes a big difference, right? Mm -hmm. And they're just saying, we're not going to get stuck. Um, China is a big producer of electric vehicles, you know, and we want to be able to sell them home and abroad and, you know, just batting on with. Um, fossil fuel you know, with petrol engines mm. is not the way. Mm. So the transition's kind of on, on, underway already. And I reckon that's why it looks like he was shooting for the stars, but yeah. maybe not. Maybe again, smart advisors have said, this is happening on right. electric vehicles, you know. Um, uh, so he's just picking up on the trend. And yeah, just... and then converting that into a number, a target. And so, of course, we have to wait and see, but this one's far more credible because mm. the transition's underway. Mm. I think your question gets to a lot of other issues too. And so the question is, yes, is the word of the United States good because mm. the United States can change on a dime mm. and everything is upended. So and that, everything depends on the Congress as well. It, it, in, in part, yes. But anyway, it's, it, the government has to be coherent. Mm. Uh, but yes, in, uh, you know, the Germans were saying uh, over the weekend, it's fantastic, Joe Biden, you're back. But can we, you know, it's like a Carol King song, will you still love me tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and and so, you know, Ooh, we, we have to see. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, it also go, but it also goes to Iran, you know, uh, will, uh, let's say they make a nuclear deal with Iran. Well, if, if a Trump-like president comes back in four years, what happens to that? Mm -hmm. So all these it is being tested and uh, Biden has no choice. He, want, he has to go forward. But what you say is right. There are doubts that people have on the credibility of the United States, given its recent history. Yeah, he does want to be the green president. He's really marked. That was part of his campaign leading up to uh, the White House, uh, the elections uh, last year. Um, the question is, again, I go back to the fact that he has such a short time before the midterms next right. year again. What can he deliver in that short term, Craig? Um, well, in terms look, of climate change? That, that is a very good point. Apart from um, promises. We would have to, we, it would be astonishing, Bruce, if he, if the Democrats held both the Senate and the House in the next election. Yes, you have to believe and, that they're going to lose the House. And the Walby analysis is that everything will then get blocked right right because the republicans say well right we've got to make a mess of this right and then hello we're the ones who can clean it up right but that seems to i don't know if it goes back to new new gingrich or it does. back but it does. that's a an approach that they've taken yeah. so i think that's a legitimate um area of concern that you cannot implement these sorts of programs and yeah. these big transitions in two years and to the extent that he has to go back, back to the Congress to complete that, 
it'll probably disappoint. So again, we're going back to can the U.S. be trusted to deliver on the promises that Joe Biden's making? No, no, that's right. And he'll be judged by the voters uh, next year on that. But, you know, let's just step back again. If the pandemic is well and truly gone, or pretty much so, so it really looks more like a flu season as opposed to a death season mm -hmm. with uh, COVID, uh, if um, the economy, you know, the growth rate projected for this year in the United States is 6%. Yeah. If that goes into next year, that is a lot well, of probably growth. Probably won't because it goes down yeah. and then it goes back and say, people say 6%, look, oh, it takes it back to where you were. That's true. So it doesn't mean there's going to be another six and another six. That's right. true. But if people feel the polarity is right, that they yeah. like that. And and if um, and particularly if employment comes back mm. and, and things become more normal. Which they should. So, so then the question is, well, do they reward Biden and Democrats for doing mm. that? But still, you just look at the numbers, the House so tight, the Senate so tight, mm. it's, it is going to be tough. But again, just to, <laughs> they, they want to get as much enacted as possible because he will still be president and the Senate has a fair chance of staying, I think, Republic, uh, Democrat, Democrat, I think right. so. And he can veto anything. So the Republican Congress says we're going to repeal this. He can veto it. He can stop that. So, but can, but can he one. then enact those bits? No, that that's he why would... he has to do it now. Yeah, right. It's all, it's right. all, it's all now. That's yeah. why this is a front-loaded agenda. And, and I was talking to some people at, in the Peterson Institute. Uh, their their sense is that he won't go in there, say to reduce tariffs or anything like that, right. because no. he would get smashed and wouldn't get it through. So they'll do the things that are popular. Yeah. But if you tried to do anything that was not popular, yeah. that probably could be yeah, a big price. price. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I found interesting was him appointing John Kerry as the climate envoy. And John Kerry's been given a seat at the National Security Council that really highlights mm -hmm. the point that climate change is a national security mm -hmm. yes. issue. Yes. Um, you know, so so that ensures that climate change is incorporated into US security policies. Is this something Craig, you think that maybe the other governments will start to look well, at I think they do. I think our own um, system yeah. does that. I mean, you know, our security it's agencies would security. be saying, uh, you know, if we get the sorts of sea level rises that we're talking about, there's a lot of um, countries that would be, you know, it, not the entire country, but a massive amount of inundation. I'm thinking, for example, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I remember yeah. flying over Bangladesh and it, God, is it water or is it land? You know, like I, I'm just using that as an example. But um, people are worried then about massive movements. Of climate people, refugees. Climate yeah. refugees. And it's not fanciful. And yeah. so, um, you know, security agencies doing their job would, would definitely mm. um, be taking that into account. Mm. Yeah. Bruce, do you think that more I do. countries will be looking at this as a I, I, No, I, I, think, I think they already are. Yeah. And when you have um, things that just uh, unhinge a country so that you have massive population movements to get away from what they're suffering, well, that causes instability. So yes, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I want to move on to China now, talking about national security and mm. security. I want to talk about China now. Beijing, as we see, is determined uh, to imprint its economic and political influence in this Asian century, as yeah. many have called it. Um, the US and China, they're going through a very testy time at the moment in terms of trade and political relations. And yet, and yet Xi Jinping decided to attend the climate summit, mm. make the same pledge as well. Yeah. How do you see this relationship? Uh, well, I, I think it'll continue to be difficult. And for one reason, one of many reasons is being very candid, it'll be popular in the US, you know, not to be close to China. Okay. Uh, because there has, I think, developed in the American psyche, the reason that, you know, the states have, have really suffered, the Rust Belt states, is China. Now, who told them that? Donald Trump for four years. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the sort of political dynamics in the US, have, I was talking about Trump, uh, Biden not going into the um, House, you know, with some sort of policy that would constitute an accommodation with yeah. China on trade policy. I don't think that's going to happen. Right? No. I think it would be good if it did, because we need a rules-based international trading system. Um, we've got the US clearly in violation of the World Trade Organization rules. 
China too. Mm. But I don't see Joe Biden saying, come on, you know, for the greater common good, we, we need to re-establish that rules-based system. Mm -hmm. So that itself is a dynamic that will keep up that tension. And I think his announcement was, you know, of all this was, we're going to take on China. Mm -hmm. We're going, we're like, you know, this is politics. We're going to take on China and we're going to win. It's interesting. We're going to take on China. We're going to win. And yet China be our global partner when it comes to climate yeah, change. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you walk that fine line in that relationship? Well, I think, I think sometimes you, uh, Russia was also at the table too, and there's yeah. tensions with Russia. So I think it, it's uh, an easy one for those countries to get into the room on something and maybe it leads to leverage on some other issues. But I think with, with both China and Russia, I think Biden has been very direct. I mean, he, is, he had a two hour phone call with Xi, which led to ultimately the meeting in Alaska with the Secretary of State and mm. the National Security Advisor mm. and the Chinese counterparts. And they were very straightforward about, we have issues with mm. you, Hong Kong, we have Taiwan, Uyghurs. South China Sea, Uyghurs. And uh, Trump certainly didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, with Russia, uh, he has a call with Putin on a Tuesday and they say, let's have a summit, that's fine. And then on Thursday, he imposes sanctions on Russia for mm. interfering in the American it's election. Like how, well, how, did, how, did, how did Vladimir like that one? Mm. So I, I, I think I call it a sort of new realism. And it's, uh, he's, Biden says, these are American values. They apply to these countries. If, if it's difficult for them, that's their problem. I'm gonna pursue it. And mm. then we'll get as much of a, of a relationship going as we can. As we can. Mm. Mm -hmm. So rather than zero, or a it, it's hundred, not a zero, right? That's, we'll, we'll that's find, right. We'll find and, something. Right, and he's not going to give up on the Uyghurs. He's not going to give up no. on Hong Kong. He's yeah. not going to give up on Ukraine, yeah. because uh, that might make them uncomfortable. Mm. Um, we've just got a few more minutes left. I want to go to some of the questions from uh, from the audience. Um, and this is this one is from Wayne Burns uh, and Bruce. You know, I know Wayne. About, yes, you talked about immigration a little earlier on. What do you believe President Biden and Harris, VP Harris, should do to tackle immigration issues on the border? Make it go away. <laughs> <laughs> this is a new problem. What happened to that wall? The problem. <laughs> yeah, the wall that? got holes in it. Um, yeah. No, Mexico didn't pay for it. That's the uh, problem. Right. Yeah. George but w this isn't a new problem. No. This is China to pay for it. It is, it is such a tough political problem. Um, but George W. Bush had an had a, uh, uh, op ed in the Washington Post last week. And he said he tried to do an immigration deal, and uh, hard heads in the Republican Party killed it. And his, his, what he's saying is you got to do two things let's take care of those who've come to America, the dreamers, for mm -hmm. a long time and, and normalize their presence in the country. And let's, let's have a barrier in, with, that will keep people who are not qualified to come to the United States mm. out. Mm. And ultimately that is the solution, but getting there is treacherous. Yeah. Uh, Biden will try, but I, as long as there's a political payoff for pushing the immigration button, it's gonna be pushed. Look at here. I mean, going back to John Howard and both people mm. and whenever it comes up, Christmas Island. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is a very, very a tough, hot button, yeah. a very hot issue, button yeah, issue. Yeah. Yes. Craig, what, what do you think? Is there an immigration solution? Well, look, I, I, I literally do not know enough about the integrity of this so-called wall, mm. um, because that would be, Bruce, the major source, wouldn't it, yeah. of, of unauthorised arrivals? Yeah, the southern border. Yes. They're not arriving by boat. They're no. not some, well, in fact, they're not arriving by plane now. I think there's some wealthy refugees arriving by boat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, but it's different from us. I mean, yeah. we don't, yeah. yeah, no, it's right. We don't have a wall, we've no, got no. water. Um, no, they're coming from Central America. Yeah. And, um, there have been both people from Cuba. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they then go to Florida and that's vote right. Republican. Because they're anti-communist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is Trump, yeah, honestly. That's right, that's, that's right. true. Yeah, Florida's yeah, going to stay Republican. Yeah, yeah. yeah I reckon the Democrats will win Texas before they win Florida. I think you're right. Because of the demographic changes. There we and, go. Yeah. But look, I don't know. Um, I've learned to say, yeah. I don't know when I don't know. Yeah. And I, I don't understand the um, how far they got with the wall. Yeah. It sounds brutal, but if you don't do something about it, you don't get re-elected. You yeah. know, if you just say, it just come. Well, he's, we he's, he's yeah. already been hit on it, and it hurts. Yeah. It, it's hurting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, another one from uh, Matthew Donovan. Uh, this is an interesting one. I'm very timely. He's on Twitter. I know. Matt. Hello, Matthew. Um, and he asks, how does he he as in president? Biden, unite the country and the parties. This is the most divided time since 1968, according to some, possibly since the Civil War. 
Um, we've just had the verdict mm -hmm. against Chauvin um, in the George Floyd yeah. uh, case. Um, and the country, you know, President Biden has said, this is a step forward. Mm. Is it a step forward, I wonder, for race relations or was it a step forward for police reform? He didn't really clarify what that step I, forward was. I was on was. the drum the other night on this uh, with, with someone from beamed in live from the US and I said, well, you know, this could constitute progress. And he said, no, it doesn't. He said, this was so clear, you know, there was a 17 year old filming it um, you could so not have Rodney said. King, though. It was so clear. Yeah, yeah. You know, but he, 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 was, yeah. he was just saying, look, um, it doesn't constitute reform because it would be completely unconscionable for a jury with all that evidence, including from the police force itself that didn't back the guy in, said, you know, absolutely the wrong thing, that it possibly doesn't constitute the sort of. Um, you know, big landmark change that yeah. that, pe that that people of colour would say, okay, things could get better for us. So mm -hmm. I was optimistic, and he kind of persuaded me not to be so optimistic. Right. The uh, police who beat Rodney King, no one went to jail, no one yep. was prosecuted. Mm -hmm. This this man has uh, been convicted of murder, and he would go to jail for a long time. Uh, so there is some change. I, the it seized the attention of the world, and. Uh, and it sort of reached everybody, white, black, mm -hmm. other people, whoever. It just reached everyone. I thought, thought it was important when Biden addressed the nation where he said, we have a problem with this, this is systemic, systemic racism. Yeah. Racism. I don't think any president, I don't think even Obama yeah. said that. Yeah. And that gets to how he presents himself, which is sort of a part of the key to all these issues. How's he going to do? He just speaks very directly. Mm -hmm. And he's talking sense. Uh, and people may disagree with it, but they feel that they're getting an honest expression on basic values mm. and his judgment. And can I make a quick, it's just a purely a political point. Um, those people who were involved in the Black Lives Matter movement were obviously very frustrated, so no one listens to us. Well, they kind of did, you know, like mm. uh, we just talked about Georgia mm. and how many African-Americans voted. I just mm. wondered, because I'm an inherent optimist, mm. that maybe they've said, you know, we, we wave our arms around and create all sorts, try to create all sorts of attention that leads to nothing. Well, this led to it's something. There, I don't want too much inside baseball, but there is an African-American Senator from South Carolina, Republican, Tim Scott, and he has a police reform bill that Trump kind of encouraged. And it's sort of halfway there. And there are, uh, African American members of the House, Karen Bass and others, talking with him. So I think the test will be if they reach agreement, mm. that will show that even with all the noise, all the partisanship, all the bitterness, yeah. that this can, that, that, that Congress can work. Mm. And we'll know within a few weeks as right. to whether they can do something. I'll well, ring you up in the middle of the night. Please do. <laughs> and and uh, it, it's also not to similar on guns, it's yeah. the same sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, just on that point, we have enough time just for your final thoughts on the 100 days of Joe Biden and what we can expect uh, going forward. I'll start with you, Ken. Well, now it's a race against time. Um, I don't think there's a need for, you know, another big um, bunch of announcements. You always got to watch as a politician that um, you're not found guilty of um, you know, big on announcements. I shouldn't mention our current prime minister, should I? You shouldn't um, mention the last election. Uh, here, no. <laughs> big on announcements, <laughs> but, but short on delivery. So if I were, um, you know, advising, I'd say, like, if there's an opportunity on gun reform or anything like that, take it. Yes, you know, because they it. don't come too often. That's right. But, but um, implementation becomes really, really important. And they just need to knuckle down and, and implement as... Um, effectively as they can, but even more important, as quickly as they can. Right. And sometimes you, you sacrifice one to the other. Mm -hmm. And in my view, it would be better if they made mistakes in implementing, just right. blow it so long as they do it, because you can clean that sort of stuff right. up later. So act and act. Just get going. Yes. Bruce. And whether, in fact, he can bring these acts to fruition by, I think August is a really important deadline mm -hmm. for, for the second package of infrastructure. If it makes it through, It'll be great news for Biden. But if it stopped, then we begin the beginning of the end of mm. uh, his effectiveness in Washington. All right. So there's a lot riding here. Yeah.
I certainly will be. And I hope that we get together again just before the midterms to have this conversation. To okay. See how it's how he's that'd going. Be fun. That'd, be, that'd be fun. That'd be terrific. Um, thank you so much, Bruce Walton. Thank you, thank you so much, Craig. You're wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to do this with us. Thank you. Thanks for calling us. <laughs> very yeah, difficult. Normally we're just whew. very difficult. I didn't have to take my whip out, so that's all right. That's all right. Yeah. And thank you so much for joining us uh, at the McKell Institute on the conversation on Joe Biden's first hundred days.